Today we uh, will be looking at Psalms 68 and 69. I normally like to try to go through more than just two, but as you look at these Psalms, you'll note with me that they have a considerable amount of Scripture in each one of them, and so I chose just to take you through two of them this evening. And so we'll begin with Psalm 68, and I'll read uh, verses 1 through, uh, through 10, and we'll get into our study tonight as we look at the Psalms. Psalm 68 and Psalm 69. Beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 10, Psalm 68, a psalm of David. Psalm 68, verse 1. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let those also who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Sing to God. Sing praises to His name. Extol Him who rides on the clouds. By His name, Yah, and rejoice before Him. A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in His holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, Selah, the earth shook. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You, O oh God, sent a plentiful rain, whereby you confirmed your inheritance when it was weary. Your congregation dwelt in it. You, O oh God, provided from your goodness for the poor. So David is writing a psalm, and as you can see, this is a psalm of deliverance and victory uh, from uh, their enemies. And I want you to notice that even as he begins, he's actually making a reference here to uh, something that is referred to as Moses' prayer. It begins with Moses' prayer that he prayed when Israel was in the wilderness. When it says, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those also who hate him flee before him. That's taken out of the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, chapter 10, verse 35. And that's how the uh, nation of Israel would set out in their march when they were uh, proceeding there in the wilderness. In Numbers 10, 35, it says, Whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before you. And so his point is very simple. When God's presence is with him, no man, no enemy can overcome him. He's saying to us that his enemies are like smoke and wax because they cannot stand up before the wind and they cannot resist the sun. The point he's making is very simple and quite obvious. They're totally helpless before God. That's why we would be putting our trust in the Lord because the enemies of God could be very well our own enemies also if they are in opposition to him and we are on his side. And so we need to have this attitude that God is on our side and that God will fight our battles. And once again, this is a theme that we see throughout the Psalms. In Psalm 56, verse 11, remember how we read in that passage, in God I have put my trust, I will not be afraid, what can man do to me? This is the same kind of thing we find in the uh, New Testament where God gives to us promise of victory and God gives to us promise of safety. One of my favorite scriptures in the uh, New Testament is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. In that particular portion of scripture, the apostle Paul says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And that's the point that David the psalmist is making here. He's saying God is for us, and seeing that God is for us, we will trust in him. And so he's saying in verse, uh, verse 2, as smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As, as wax melts before the fire, let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But in verse 3, let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. Those who love God are not going to be angry when God begins to reveal His righteous anger, is what He is saying there. Instead, what happens is the, the righteous begin to rejoice, and the righteous begin singing praises to God. Now, notice with me that He speaks of Him as the one who rides upon the clouds. When He uses that phrase, it's, it's a picture of His majesty, how exalted He is. And so, He's saying what we are to do is praise the Lord because He is exalted. Praise the Lord because... He has set us free. Now, notice in verse 4 when it says, by his name, Yah. Now, that is, what, that is what is called a contraction, 
And it's the, the name of God, it's the proper name of God that is found in the Old Testament uh, some 5,929 times. And uh, it's what would be referred to as his proper name or the name that he is called by, by the nation of Israel, without going into a lot of information that most of you really don't require or desire to know. Uh, the bottom line is, is the name Yah is a contraction of the word that we have chosen to call Jehovah. And the word Jehovah is the proper name of God. Now, I'll say this very briefly. I got myself into something that some of you might... Well, anyway, let me just say it, then I'll move on. You will have someone knock on your door. You know where I'm going with this one, right? And they'll knock on your door, and they'll say to you that you need to know the proper name of God or else you cannot really pray to Him. And so they will tell you the proper name of God is Jehovah. And I've had many a discussion with Jehovah's Witnesses who will indeed say that to you. They'll say to you that in order for God to listen to your prayer, you need to know His proper name, and therefore His proper name is Jehovah. Here's your problem, and this is the answer that I've normally given to Jehovah's Witnesses. Problem is, is in the Hebrew language, when you're writing Hebrew, you do not insert vowels. When you write Hebrew, it's only consonants. And so Jehovah actually is a word that has been made up, inserting vowels. Nobody knows what the, the real original pronunciation of that name is. That's one of the reasons why the Lord is referred to as Lord, because the name of God is unpronounceable and was too holy to be used, and therefore they would substitute the word Lord. When you see here in this particular passage by his name Yah, that's a contraction of Jehovah, but that is not for sure the exact word that you would use in reference to him. And so when we pray to the Lord, and this is my answer when I speak to Jehovah's Witnesses, I speak to the Lord through Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ gave me his name for access to the Father. So I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have stated to them, God being omniscient, even if I mispronounce his name or use the wrong name, I'm certain he knows I'm speaking to him. The same way that when my dad would speak to me or when my kids, my kids would say, Dad, you know, when they were little, they didn't know my name. They would just say basically, ooh, ooh, you. And I knew who they were speaking to. Somebody asked me recently, what does your grandson call you? And, and the answer is anything he wants. Because I know his voice and I know when he's speaking to me and that's all that matters. He'll give me a name and I'll answer to it. Well, when the Lord was ministering to the nation of Israel, he gave to them his covenant name, but that name was kept by them. Even to this day, Jewish people, Orthodox especially, even when they're writing the name of God, will not insert a vowel. And some of you know that if you receive a letter from a Jewish friend, if they're writing the name God, they will put G, then they'll have an underline, and then they'll, they'll close that with uh, the letter D, but they don't even put the vowel O in there for you, but that is tradition that they've received for thousands of years now. And so basically all he's saying here, and it's not that it's minimal or minimizing, but what he is saying is that we come to the Lord through this covenant name, this relationship that we have with him, and this is the Lord who rides on the clouds. In other words, he's majestic and he, is, he has uh, glory. Now, continuing in verse 5, it says, A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. So God protects the helpless. This is a theme that you find throughout the Bible. God protects the helpless. Not only does he protect the helpless, but God also comforts the lonely. And those who have no family... God places in family. Notice verse 6, how he says, God sets the solitary in families. One of the things that I like to emphasize in this particular ministry, something that the Lord gave to me when I first got saved, is the amazing reality of the fact that when you're born again, when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, when you become a born-again Christian, the Holy Spirit of God indwells you. But you were not saved to be alone. As a matter of fact, one of the things that God says is bad, the very first thing that he said is not good, is that a man should be alone. God intends, in other words, for us to have fellowship. He intends for us to have fellowship with him, and he intends for us to have fellowship with one another in the family of God. Now, some people are, are born and raised and don't really ever have a sense of family. Some people may be uh, orphaned or whatever, 
Some people have no family. But what he is saying here is that God brings the solitary and he places them in family. And so for me, one of the things I continue to encourage you in, and it's up to you whether you respond to this or not. This is something you choose to do. Some have chosen to do so and have been blessed because of it. Others refuse to do so and continue to live lonely lives, but it's up to you to make the decision. You need to understand, though, as a Christian, that you haven't been saved to be by yourself. You've been saved and placed to, into a giant family. And so every person around you who's born again is part of your family. Now, now you may not like that. You might not say, I want that person in my family. I just assume they not be. Um, one of my friends was sharing recently at a pastor's conference, and he said something like this. He said, you know, he said, when my mom and my dad got married, they decided to have children, and I was born. And then they did something that I really, really am upset about. I was upset about as a child because they never sought my opinion, and they never asked for my advice. They simply did it. They went and had children, other children besides me. He said, can you believe that? And when you think about how absurd that is, you, you, it's kind of like that with us, though. I mean, God has children, He has other children, and it's more than just about us. But one of the things I've discovered is that in the family of God, we actually are adding, we actually are receiving. It's because God doesn't want you to be alone. And in churches like this, there really isn't an excuse for you to be alone. There's so much emphasis here from this pulpit and within the confines of this church there's so much emphasis on fellowship. It's one of the four pillars that we have, the four things that make this church what it is, the Word of God, the worship of God, the witness of God's people, and the witness of God's people. It's one of the four pillars. That's why we emphasize so many things, times of, of, of fellowship. See, the reason we have a, a, a cafe and the reason we have barbecues isn't because we're making so much money, you know, challenging McDonald's and Carl's Jr. and Starbucks. You know, that's not what it's all about for us. What it's all about for us is to give you an opportunity to hang around with somebody and get to know them. The reason we have barbecues when we have baptisms isn't so that we can soak you from, for some more, uh, more money, because that's not how it works, because you know that you can't go out and buy a steak and all the things that you get here for a few bucks like we charge you. That's, that's the whole point. And the point is, is so that you can have relationship, you can have an excuse for friendship. That's what we want for you. The reason we have retreats, and men, as I speak to you and think of the retreat, the reason we have it is so that you can have opportunity to make a friend, because when I was a young believer, I discovered that when I didn't have accountability, when I didn't have a friend, somebody who knew my heart, somebody I could speak to, somebody who could pray for me and knew where I was at in the Lord, I discovered that I could pretend to be doing well, but be backsliding. I discovered that I could do things that nobody knew about and still have all appearances of being a Christian. But when I made friends, people who would pray for me and ask me how I'm doing in the condition of my soul and, and my spiritual life, it helped me to grow. And I discovered that I need relationships. That's why we have retreats. That's why we have men's groups. That's why we have women's groups. That's why we have the various things that we offer to you. It's not so that we can fill up a bulletin with events and, and so that I can go to a pastor's conference and say, oh, look at all the things that our church offers. No, it's so that we can have real, genuine relationship. And so again, we're going to have a men's retreat. I invite every man to go to that retreat, to take the opportunity to do so, because there you may find a friend that can be that in your life when you're going through hard times. There you can find somebody that you'll have a phone number where you can call up and you can say to him, listen, can you pray for me? I don't want to give you details. It's kind of heavy. I just need to be covered with prayer. You see, God brings us into a family. That's what he's saying. God sets the solitary in families. Why? Because he's our father and he wants us to live as a family with one another. In Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30, Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. So what happens is we become part of his family and we receive so many blessings and so God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. In other words, to those who are unwilling to enter into his family, 
uh, those who do not love him, those will be judged. They are actually exiled in this dry land. Verse 7, O God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the uh, wilderness, Silah, the earth shook. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You, O God, sent a plentiful rain, whereby you confirmed your inheritance. When it was weary, your congregation dwelt in it. You, O God, provided from your goodness for the poor. So he recalls how God led the children of Israel out of Egypt and through the wilderness. That's what he's speaking about, how that God went before them in a pillar of fire and a cloud. And he's speaking to them, and he's, he's remembering that. And in verse 9, he's, he's speaking about how God sent a plentiful rain and confirmed his inheritance. In other words, God provided for them. He provided rain, but he also rained down on them blessings of manna, and he rained down on them meat and all of that because he cared for them. And he cared for them because they were all poor after their Egyptian bondage. Verse 11, the Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those who proclaimed it. Kings of armies flee. They flee, and she who remains at home divides the spoil. And though you lie down among the sheepfolds, yet you will be like the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow in Solomon. And so as Israel began to conquer the promised land, the point is, and he's reminding the children of Israel how that kings began to flee before them. The husbands would go out and they would battle and they would return with spoils of war. And though the wives remained behind, they shared in the things that the husband was able to gain. And when God scattered the enemies, even as he is saying here in verse 14, their bodies looked like it was snowing on a mountain. He's just speaking about how God conquered. In verse 15, a mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is a mountain of Bashan. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. So he's speaking of the Golan Heights when he speaks of these mountains and all, and it's like the Golan Heights is jealous of Mount Zion. Well, Mount Zion is a place that God has determined that he's going to dwell. And he's simply pointing out the fact that uh, the city of Jerusalem there in Mount Zion is the place that God has chosen to fellowship with man. And, and that's ultimately where the temple of God was built and and so he's comparing that, and he's basically saying the Golan Heights there to the east and to the north of Jerusalem is jealous because God has chosen to dwell there in the city of Jerusalem. Verse 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. So when he speaks of the chariots of God, we need to put that in context. It's like he's speaking about the tanks and uh, the armor, because during that day, a chariot was like a tank. And so he's speaking concerning the fact that God is an invincible warrior, and he's surrounded by warriors. He's the holy warrior. He goes before his people, and he protects them, and he blesses them. Now, when he says in verse 18, you have ascended on high, you led captivity captive, that's a passage that is actually quoted in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4 in reference to Jesus Christ. You receive gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. And so this is what he's speaking about. It's actually a, a picture of the Lord um, successful in, in battle. Now, it is also a prophetic picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who was successful in redemption. Because when Jesus Christ died, he descended. As he descended, he went into this waiting place, Hades, that was divided at that time into two compartments, the compartment of the righteous dead and the compartment of the unrighteous dead. When the Lord Jesus Christ went into that area, he led captivity captive, bringing the righteous dead with him. He ascended into heaven. This is all found in Ephesians chapter 4. And when he ascended into heaven, then he sent gifts to men. He sent the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So it's a picture of God being victorious. Where is the greatest victory that God ever had? It's the cross of Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ crushed the enemy and defeated him. And in doing so, those of us who had been slaves to sin all our lives were now set free. Listen, Christianity is not a philosophy 
When you think about Christianity, it has philosophic elements to it, but it is not simply a man's division or devising of, of how to live a successful life. Christianity is something we've received from God that in, it contains within it the message of redemption, the message of salvation, the message of freedom. We who at one time are slaves to sin, born as sinners, living as sinners, enslaved to the sin, have been set free by Jesus Christ who conquers on our behalf. As he conquers on our behalf and wins the war, he gives terms of peace. The terms of peace that he gives is found in the gospel. The gospel is God's declaration of terms of peace, and it calls for unconditional surrender. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and won victory, he now declares to us that he is the victor, and in order for you to have peace with him, you need to surrender. When you receive Christ as Lord and Savior, you are saying, God, be merciful to me. I've been your enemy. I am a sinner. I have rejected you. I have nothing to do with you. When you receive that term of peace, the gospel of reconciliation to what God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, when you receive that message of Jesus Christ and you embrace it on a personal level and say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, I'm part of that world. Jesus died for me so that if I believe in him, I will have everlasting life. I do believe in you, Jesus, not just that you're a historic figure, not just that there is more than likely a great possibility that a Jewish man 2,000 years ago lived in Israel. No, I believe that you are everyone, everything that you say you are. I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe that you took my sin upon you. I believe that you are the Lamb of God. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you were buried. I believe that the third day you rose again from the dead. I believe that you walked amongst men for 40 days and ascended into heaven, and I believe you sent the Holy Spirit to indwell those who trust in you. I receive your terms of peace. And in doing so, that's God's victory lived out in your life. So Paul took this particular scripture here, and he showed us its fulfillment in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Verse 19, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation, Selah. Our God is the God of salvation, and to God the Lord belong escapes, uh, and to, to God the Lord belong escapes from death. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with his benefits. God every day blesses us. Not only does he bless us every day. Now, somebody's in here saying, well, you know, he must have skipped me today. No, God blesses us every day. God does bless us every day. God blesses me every day. You know, one of the problems that I have sometimes is I just don't recognize the blessings because I'm unthankful because maybe I expect more than I got today. But God blesses me every day. The fact that I woke up this morning and was able to serve him, the fact that I have a great wife and love my kids and, and all of that, every day, every day, God, and he says not just, not just gives, but he loads you with benefits. He pours them on. And not only does he bless you every day, but he's given you something beyond this. He's given you a hope for heaven, a heavenly hope, guys. I mean, one of these days, and, and it's not really that long from now, by the way. It really isn't. Some of you are younger, and you'll say, oh, no, I've got a long time to go. We really don't know how long we have, do we? All I know is, you know, the uh, road behind me is a lot longer than the road in front of me. I know that the Lord is going to be receiving me to be with him soon, sooner than later. And so he has not only blessed me in this life, and he blesses me so much every day, but he also has heaven on top of that. Now think about that for just a moment, that God blesses you every day in one way or another probably multiple times. That's what he's saying here. He said he loads you, he daily loads you with benefits, but he's also the God of our salvation. So not only do I have a good life here and now, but I have a good eternity waiting for me because of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our God, the God of salvation. In verse 21, but God will wound the head of his enemies, the hairy scalp. That's an interesting way to put it, huh? The hairy scalp of the one who still goes on in his trespasses. 
The Lord said, I will bring back from Bashan, I will bring them back from the depths of the sea, that your foot may crush them in blood, and the tongues of your dogs may have their portion from their enemies. Uh, in other words, God is going to avenge his people on their enemies. It's God who wounds the head of the enemies. They have seen your procession, O oh God, the procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. The singers went before, the players on instruments followed after. Among them were the maidens playing timbrels. Bless God in the congregations, the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There's little Benjamin, their leader, the princes of Judah and their company, the princes of Zebulun and the princes of Naphtali. These names here, Benjamin, Judah, Zebulun, and Naphtali, these are four names of the tribes of Israel, and they represent the 12 tribes, even as he's mentioned them. And basically what he's pointing to here is God returning victoriously from battle and the nations rejoicing along with him as he does so. Verse 28, your God has commanded your strength. Strengthen, O God, what you have done for us. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring presents to you. Rebuke the beasts of the reeds, the, the herd of bulls with the calves of the peoples, till everyone submits himself with pieces of silver. Scatter the peoples who delight in war. Envoys will come out of Egypt. Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hands to God. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Oh, sing praises to the Lord, Selah, to him who rides on the heaven of heavens, which were of old. Indeed, he sends out his voice, a mighty voice, ascribe strength to God. His excellence is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. O oh God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. And so in closing, he's basically saying God is to receive worship, and those who do not worship him should be scattered Notice that Egypt and Ethiopia are singled out as those who will worship the Lord, which is interesting to me because prophetically this is, this is um, something that will occur in the very end. In the very end, Egypt and Ethiopia both are, are representative of nations, many nations that ultimately will come and sing praises to God. When he speaks in verses 32 through 35 and tells us to sing to God, the bottom line is all kingdoms belong to God. And seeing that all kingdoms belong to him, all kingdoms should sing praises unto him. Why? Well, verse 35 tells us, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. And one of the ways that I apply that in my personal life, when it says you are more awesome than your holy places, is very simple, guys. God is more than the temple that contained him because it could not contain him. He just chose to dwell there. It's greater than any place on the face of the earth. Sometimes when you go to Israel, they'll talk to you about going to a holy site, and they call it the holy land. The, the land is not holy. It's filled with people who don't have a relationship with God, frankly. The land is not holy. As a matter of fact, one of the things that you'll discover when you go there is how, how unholy it really is in many ways. I mean, if you've never been to Israel on your first trip to Israel, you, you come in and you, you fly into Tel Aviv and you're, you're sitting there on the plane and you're looking at as you've flown into the nation and all and, and, and your Bible begins to come alive in your mind, I mean, almost from the very beginning. And then you'll get off the, um, the plane and you have to go through customs and, and then you go and pick up your luggage and then we have some buses waiting for us and then you'll walk out and you'll be seated in that bus and if it's your first time there, you might do something like I did the very first time I was just seated there thinking, man, this is blowing my mind. I, I've read the Bible for a number of years now, but, but to actually be in the place where Jesus lived and all the works of God were manifested so gloriously and all, and I was sitting there in the bus when our Jewish Orthodox guide uh, comes up and stands in the very front of the bus, and I'll never forget how he looked at us and he got the microphone and turned it on, and, and he, the first thing he said to us was, welcome home. And it was just so like, yeah, I feel like I'm home. It, it's just so real for me. I just thought, that's the feeling I'm having right now. All of these years that I've been reading the Bible and teaching the Bible, I finally have an opportunity to see the sights that I have tried to envision in my mind. Now I can see these. And when you go into Nazareth and, and when you go into Galilee and when you, you go into Capernaum and and you see all of these things when you're on a boat going across the Sea of Galilee, 
when you stop at this particular place that we stop at, and they have what they call St. Peter's fish, and, and they'll put a fish on your plate there, and they'll, sometimes they'll put a little coin in it to remind you of how Peter fished and found a coin in the mouth of a fish and all, and they usually give it to the, one of the pastors to make him think that, you know, he's very holy and all. And, and they do that, and, and it's just one thing after another. And, and you can get caught up. You can get caught up with thinking how wonderful this land is. The people are so warm to you and everything, and they are. And then, and then every once in a while, you're awakened to the fact that they still need the Lord. They need God. You go to a site, and, and, and somebody will be rude to you, or something occurs that, that wakes you up. Marie and I, in our very first trip, I can still remember, we were walking, and some young boys uh, came walking up to, uh, to some of the girls were walking by, and they were using some, some, some American profanity, and it was pretty bad. And we had to tell them, hey, boys, you know, why don't you cool it with your language? And it wakes you up. You, you realize that, that these people need the Lord. When you're in the garden and you're having communion and some kids are yelling from the other side of the fence there and, hey, do you want to buy some postcards? And they interrupt the moments that you're having. You discover that there's a tremendous need there. There is no such place as a holy land in the sight. As a matter of fact, that's what he's saying here. God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The holy places, you know, like the temple and all, are representative of the presence of God, but that does not take the place of God. That's why this building to us is just that. It's a building. We, we liken it to a barn. This building is a barn. We're his cattle. We're his sheep. We come in here. We mess it up, and we leave. It's just a barn. You know, that's why I'm not attached to this building. One day the Lord might say, it's time to move someplace else, and, and, and the minute he says, move, I'm, I'm ready to go. We're not attached to buildings. He is more holy than his sacred places. What we want to be is in fellowship with him wherever he may be. And so that's something to keep in mind and all because uh, he is more awesome than his holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. And then concludes by saying, blessed be God. Psalm 69, continuing, another psalm of David. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I'm weary with my crying. My throat's dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They're mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully. Though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. Oh, God, you know my foolishness. My sins are not hidden from you. Let, let not those who wait for you, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel, because for your sake I've borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's children, because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth my garment. I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gate speak against me. I am the song of the drunkards. And so another cheery psalm by David. <laughs> Next to us, Psalm 22. This is the most frequently quoted psalm in the New Testament. It applies basically to a situation that David, the psalmist, is experiencing in his lifetime, and yet there are scriptures, and you'll see them, and I'll point them out to you if you don't recognize them, that prophetically speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. But beginning in verses 1 through 3, he's crying out for help. Save me, O God, the waters have come up to my neck, and I sink in deep mire. So he's sinking fast. Troubles are surrounding him. He says, my throat is dry from calling out for help. I'm drained from my constant crying. Some of us have been in situations, in other words, that we can, re we can recognize this in our own life. We've gone through something. We feel like we're being overwhelmed, and we cry out to God to the point where we can cry no more. Our voice even becomes weak. We're, we're just drying out from crying out and seeking the Lord. Now, what's his problem? Well, he tells us in verse 4, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They're mighty who would destroy me. Being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. My enemies are hating me, and they have no reason to do so. They hate me because they think I have taken from them something that belongs to them. And as a matter of fact, and I want you to notice it, he says in verse 4, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. Now, this psalm here, in this particular scripture, verse 4, 
Those who hate me without cause are more than the hair of my head is actually repeated in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 24 and 25. In John, chapter 15, verses 24 and 25, Jesus is speaking. And in that passage, Jesus said, If I had done nothing among them, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my Father. But this happened, that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. They hate God, and they hate Jesus Christ. But they hate me without a cause. What have I ever done? Now, think about it for a minute. You and I, we might cry out, and we might say, well, I have done some, you know, I've done nothing wrong to them, but perhaps we have. It's possible that I have without knowing it. I've had people upset with me over the years who've shared with me what I've done, and I didn't realize I'd done that. You know, I can't plead not guilty. I mean, I may have done it. How do I know? There are things that I can do that, without even knowing it, without even wanting to do it. You can do the same thing. You might say something to somebody that you didn't intend to hurt their feelings. They asked you, how, you know, your opinion. How do you think I look? And you told them, you look terrible. You didn't know I hurt their feelings, but it did. Do I look fat? Yeah. You didn't mean to hurt their feelings, you know. There are times that I, I have definitely done that, and I didn't real, realize that and all. So I can't be like Jesus. I can't say that. I can't say they hated me without a cause. But you know what? Jesus can say that. Now, David, in this particular case, David is innocent of the charges that have been leveled against him. He's saying they hate me for no good reason. I didn't do to them what they say that, that I've done. But in the case of Jesus... Who could point to him and ever say, you've done wrong? What person could ever point to Jesus Christ and ever say, you lied, you stole, you used profanity, you lusted after that person? Who could ever point to Jesus and say that? And Jesus did nothing but good. That's what he was known for, is doing good. He went about doing good and healing all who were ill. And when Jesus went about doing these kinds of things, he's the one who can say, they hated me without cause, but that's going to fulfill the Scripture. Now, they, they say that uh, he has taken something that belongs to them. Though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. They're saying that he stole something. Now, what would it be that during the time of Christ, people would say that Jesus had stolen from them? Well, in John chapter 11, verse 48, when... Uh, when the priests were discussing amongst themselves what they were going to do with Jesus, in John eleven forty eight, 48, they said this, If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. The Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. We believe that we have the right to lead these people in the truth from God's Word, and Jesus has come and is removing that from us. They think that Jesus Christ was a usurper when in reality they were misrepresenting the kingdom of God. Jesus is the one who had the right to speak. They were the ones who needed to be silent. Now in verse 5, Oh God, you know my foolishness. My sins are not hidden from you. Let not those who wait for you, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel, because for your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and alien to my mother's children because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Now, because of his deep love for God, David had become a stranger to his own family. As a matter of fact, the drunks began to sing about him and make songs up about him. He's telling us that his entire way of life was subject to ridicule and scorn and his sorrow over sin, even, when he would be mourning over that. Notice verse 10, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, even that was mocked by people, even his righteousness now, when you think about this for a moment and you apply this to Jesus because in verse 8 and 9, uh, these do apply to the Lord. I've become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's children because zeal for your house has eaten me up. The reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, and let me, let me entertain your mind for just a moment here, and, and I want you to think with me for just, just a moment about this. When you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Uh, do you think that he came from a, a happy home? Now, normally, I would say, well, never really thought about it, to be honest with you. I'd assume that he came from a happy home. Well, why would I assume that? Well, I would assume that because his father was a righteous man. His, you know, uh, Joseph, um, the husband of Mary, was a righteous man. And so Mary was a righteous woman. And so a righteous man and a righteous woman and Jesus, that sounds pretty good to me. But the bottom line is we need to remember that John chapter 7 tells us that he had brothers and Matthew also tells us that he had sisters who did not believe in him. Now, when you think about that for just a moment, ask yourself that question again. Do you think that Jesus came from a happy home? And the possibility is that he may not have. Imagine his, his brothers when they would be speaking to some of the kids who they hung around with. And imagine how the other kids would speak to the brothers of Jesus, the half-brothers, and could say that your mother Mary, before she married Joseph, was pregnant with your older brother Jesus. And imagine the stress that that could bring into a home. Imagine that that home could very well have had some stresses related to who Jesus is, his conception, and all that was related to that. And it is possible that they had strife. And not only that, but he says, I'm an alien to them. They don't understand me. I'm like a foreigner. I don't belong, is the way that they're looking at me. Now, Jesus Christ being absolutely righteous, could you imagine growing up with a perfect person, somebody who never did a single thing wrong ever? When Mary said, Jesus, make your bed, he made a bed. No, I didn't say create a bed. I meant make your bed. <laughs> Could you imagine Jesus go to bed and Jesus would just go to bed? He never did anything that little stinkers like, like, like us did. He was perfect. Now, how would you like to be raised next to somebody who, who really was perfect? Not somebody who thought they were perfect, but somebody who really was perfect. There was more than likely some stress in the home. They didn't understand who he was. If you take notes, Mark chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 make that clear. The multitude came together again. They could not so much as eat bread. When his own people heard about it, speaking of his family, when his own people heard about it, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And that's how they looked at the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't understand the zeal that he had for God. In, in John chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, uh, John tells us that Jesus found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, poured out the changers' money, overturned the tables, and he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. His brothers could very well have thought he was an overreactor. Why get so upset over something like that? It's been like that for so long. Why do you have to go in and cause such a problem, Jesus? When Marie and I got together, got married, she began to see in, in me something that she didn't realize I had when we were dating, and that is something she's gotten used to now, but had a little bit of a time of adjusting to, to be honest with you, and that is passion. I have passion over certain things. When I see something that is wrong or has been wronging somebody, I'm one of those people that, that get upset about it, and I would tell her that is just simply wrong. That shouldn't have been done. And even today, I was talking to her, just today, and I was talking to her about something that I thought was, it was wrong. And as I was talking to her, I said, I'm yelling at you, aren't I? And she said, yeah, honey, you are. Don't be yelling. Don't yell at me. I didn't do anything. And she laughs because she knows me because I just get so worked up. You know, I'll say, but that is just wrong. It's a wrong thing to do. And I get worked up like that. Now, Marie is real mellow. And she'll go, yes, it is. 
She can feel as strongly as I do. It just doesn't come out. Jesus' brothers saw the zeal in his life. Zeal for your house has consumed me. And I'm certain they did not understand the man who was before them. I'm certain they didn't. And sometimes people, by the way, when pastors like me will stand up and say something, sometimes people get so upset. How could you be so judgmental? How could you be so harsh? Where's your love? How could you say that? There have been seasons when uh, a bad doctrine has infiltrated the church and all, and, and I have stood up and I have said, you need to be careful with this particular doctrine, and I'll name the doctrine, and there have been times when I have named the teacher, and, and boy, people will get so upset. I have had people upset so many times, so many times, when I've said, that is hypocrisy, that is wrong. And people would get upset at me and say, how harsh and, and how, how judgmental you are. People don't understand. When, when I'll give you an example that's you know, close to my heart. It's not exactly what I'm saying, but it's similar. Um, some of you may have been here when I made the announcement concerning my daughter, uh, Krenny, and how she became pregnant, and, and, and I read a prepared statement to you, and, and my heart was broken, and you all know that. My heart was broken about that. And I shared, and I, I, I just, I had to read uh, what I had prepared to make sure that I said it correctly. And we had somebody in the church who, um, it, came, it, it normally comes back to me, I don't know why, but it does. And somebody who was here in the church said, you know, uh, well, he, he shouldn't be that way. He shouldn't, you know, he doesn't, he's, it's like he doesn't love his, his daughter and he's ashamed of his grandson. And th that was never the case, never has been the case. Never was the case and never has been the case. That I'm ashamed of my daughter? that I'd be ashamed of my grandson? You have got to be kidding me. The grief that you saw was over sin. It was because there should have been a marriage. There should have been the right thing done. But we live in a society that says, oh, just blow it off, it's the grace of God. No, wait a minute. Jesus Christ died to set me free from sin, and it grieves me when I sin. And it grieves me that my daughter sinned. But does that mean I don't love my daughter? Does that mean that I don't love my grandson? Whoever would think that doesn't know me and doesn't know Scripture. God loves me, but he hates sin. He hates it so much he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to set me free from it. So I can't enter into sin willingly thinking, oh, it's the blood of Christ will cover me. It cost Jesus his life. How can I minimize that? But people today don't understand that. So they think that that kind of passion must be judgmentalism or a lack of love or a misunderstanding of what God is really about. And in reality, a person who didn't understand that, they don't know the holiness of God. And they more than likely have minimized their sin in their life to make it acceptable to God. But Jesus died on the cross to set me free from those things. And so there's a passion in my heart about it. Now, in this generation, that, 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 there are a lot of people who won't believe that, who don't understand that, because for them, sin is not that big a deal. It's just something we all do, so I make a big effort to worry about that. Well, when I think of my, my Savior, Jesus Christ, getting beaten, a crown of thorn placed on his head, when I think about him being hanged on a cross and, and, and tortured till he died, it makes a lot of difference to me. And I don't want to add, if you will, I don't want to add to the sorrows of the one whom I can grieve when I grieve his spirit. And so there's a passion. Zeal for your house has consumed me. And his brothers didn't understand that. I'm certain they didn't. They said, he is out of his mind. And, and that's what he's speaking about here in this psalm. Picking up at verse, uh, verse 13. But as for me... My prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut its mouth on me. And so he basically is asking the Lord 
to take care of him and deliver him. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw near to my soul. Redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. So the question has to be asked, when you're in trouble, do you want to be helped now or do you want your help to be delayed? If you're drowning, do you want to be pulled out of the water right now or would you like to drown for another 10 minutes? You know, if you're in a house that's on fire, do you want them to come and drag you out now or would you like to stay for a few, few, few more minutes? Well, obviously, I want to be helped right now and that's what David is saying. Deliver me immediately, Lord. I need your help immediately. Now, I need your mercy, he's saying. I need your salvation and I need your deliverance. And the time for all of this is not next week. The time for all of this is right now. Now, when I look at this, and I'm going to look for a certain scripture here that I read, verse 13, when I look at this, I want you to notice, he says, as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. I want you to see this, O Lord, in the acceptable time. And why do I want to point that out to you? Briefly, because that's a scripture that is repeated in uh, 2 Corinthians, in chapter 6, verse 2. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, the apostle Paul says it this way. He says, in an acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. Then he goes on to say, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. If I'm in a house that's on fire and I see the firefighter there at the door, I'm going to scream at the top of my lungs if I can't save myself, which I can't. I'm going to say to him, save me now. If I'm drowning, which I've almost drowned numerous times because I don't swim very good, and I'm out there in the water and I've got a cramp, I need help now, not next week and not next month. I need help now because I'm going to die now. And that's the point he's making. Listen carefully because this is very practical to us. If you're not saved, that's the point Paul's making. If you're not saved, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Not I will hear you some other time or let me think about that. There have been so many times that, I, uh, that, that people in this church I know have been in here who know they're not saved, who know they're not in relationship with God, who know that they need God, who know that they have a, a sin issue and they need deliverance and they hear the message and as they hear the message, they're saying, that applies to me. I know it does. I know it does. That's the truth and I know it applies to me and the invitation is given, and they don't come forward. God's Word is not next week. God's Word is, is now. Why do you want, I could ask, to go through more pain? I can tell you, I've been there. I'm 16 years old. I'm laying on a beach, and there are all these girls running around me in bikinis. And I'm only 16 years old. And I have some Jesus freak witness to me. And I'm thinking, why are you bothering me? You're making me guilty because I've been checking these girls out. And now you're making me feel bad. You know, God talk and God stuff belongs in the church, doesn't belong here in Newport. You know, leave me alone. And I remember looking at this guy, politely talking to him, but wanting him, him to leave me alone because my reasoning was, was, I don't want God right now. I believe what he's saying is true, and I agree in principle that it is. I think that every person should be a good person, and I think religion is a good thing, and I think Jesus Christ really did exist. But man, I, this, this is exactly what I was thinking, but I'm only 16 years old. Man, I, I still got a lot of living to do. For me, a lot of living meant a lot of drinking, a lot of smoking dope, a, a lot of partying. I mean, I got a lot of things to do. I mean, you're telling me that I shouldn't have that kind of joy and enjoyment? You got to be kidding. When I'm old and I got no more teeth and my hair's falling out, you know, and I'm about to die, then at that time, maybe I can ask God and it'll be cool. But not right now. And I can still remember. And you know what? There's a lot of people who are like that. And you, know, it doesn't, you don't even have to be 16. You could be 26, 36, 46, 56, 66. You could be, 
I remember giving an invitation in this church, and a man who was over 80 years old came forward. You know, he waited all that time to get right with God. Can you imagine that? All that time. Now is the accepted time. Not next week. Not next month. The time is now. So that God can begin to bless you now. And so that's what the psalmist is reminding. As for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the accepted time, acceptable time. Continuing on in verse, uh, verse 19, you know my, my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are, are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart. I'm full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Now, obviously, this is prophetically applying to Jesus Christ. And David is finding comfort in knowing that God loves him. He also knows that God knows all the details. He knows that God is hearing all the vicious things that have been said and done, and he's trusting him. But this also relates to Jesus Christ. Verse 20, when he says, Reproach has broken my heart. I'm full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. For comforters, I found none. There's Jesus on the cross, and there's nobody there who has given him comfort. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And this was prophetically fulfilled in Matthew 27. And so this is obviously a, a picture of Jesus dying on the cross. Verse 22, Let their table become a snare before them, their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see. Make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them. Let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate. Let no one dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom you've struck and talk of the grief of those you have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not to be written with the righteous. I'm poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bull which has horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad, and you who seek God, your heart shall live. For the Lord hears the poor, does not despise his prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. God will save Zion, build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and possess it. Also the descendants of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. And so in closing, as we look at the conclusion of his psalm, very basic things, he's basically simply saying, God, bring on their heads what they desire for me. This is just because they're persecuting the righteous and they're rebelling against you. Now, in verse 25, when he says, let their habitation be desolate, let no one dwell in their tents, this is something that was quoted in the New Testament. This is quoted in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. It's, uh, it's in reference to Judas. It says in Acts 1, 18 through 20, speaking of Judas, this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. Falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and his entrails gushed out. It became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, let no one live in it, let another take his office. So this is in reference prophetically to Judas, who ultimately died because of his, his traitorous uh, relationship to Jesus. He hanged himself and ultimately died. Now, in verse 28, when he says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous, may they not share in God's eternal blessings, is what he's saying here. May they not have eternal life. And then finally, he concludes by simply saying, I'm weak, I'm in need, but I do praise you because you deliver me. Finally, we need to remember that the sacrifice of praise is better than the sacrifice of an ox or a bull because praise is a spontaneous result of a thankful heart. And I really believe very strongly that the whole created universe is intended to, to glorify God in one way or another. But we have been given the opportunity to praise the Lord because God works in our hearts. He gives us so many blessings that we can verbally just speak to Him and we can say to Him, God, I am just so blessed by you. And finally, I would encourage you in this to get into the habit of doing something very simple. You know, how we, we speak about counting your blessings one by one. I think that God has blessed us so many times you really couldn't enumerate all the blessings of God in your life. 
But may I encourage you, even after we see this and how he closes in verse 34 by saying, let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them, I, I really want to encourage you to get into the habit of learning to be thankful to God, to thank him for what he has done in your life, to learn to bless the Lord. And by the way, to learn to thank God without you know, adding or tacking something on, to, to learn to say, thank you, God, for for my, my kids without saying, but could you do something with them? Because they're driving me nuts. You know, thank you, God, for my wife, but Lord, would you please, she's just, you know, tell her to shut up once in a while, you know. <laughs> thank you, God, for my husband. He could shower once, you know, things like that. I really think that if we get into the habit of praising the Lord, and, and this is sincere, you know, and, and I don't want to rush through it, but because it's been very important in my life, if, if we learn to gr be grateful and thankful without qualifying the blessings of God and trying to change some things that we don't like, but simply learn to say to God, Lord, I thank you so much for my mom. I thank you so much for my dad. Lord, I thank you so much for my brothers. I thank you for my sister, if you have them. Lord, I thank you for my kids, if you have children. Father, I thank you so much for my friends. Lord, I thank you so much for the church that you've given to me. I thank you for those who serve there. I thank you for the blessings you brought into my life. Thank you, Father, for the job that you've given to me. I prayed for it, and you supplied it. Thank you so much. Lord, thank you for the car that I can drive, and thank you for the shoes that I put on my feet. Lord, I thank you so much for a bed that I can sleep in and a pillow I can place my head on. Father, I thank you that I do have a refrigerator, and, Father, there's some food in it, and I thank you for that food. Lord, I just thank you. I just thank you for the fact that I can walk up to, to, a, to a water fountain and I can turn it on and I can drink water, pure water, and I'm not going to get sick as I drink it. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for so many things that you brought into my life that I take for granted. And Lord, I want to learn to praise you. I want to learn to just thank you without saying, but God, and complaining all the time, Lord, could you make me into a thankful person, a person who, who, who sees the benefits that you've loaded into my life. And you see, guys, yeah, thankfulness comes from the heart of somebody who's been saved. Somebody who understands that, that you are going to hell, but God reached down and turned you around, and now you're heaven-bound. And when you have that mentality, then all things are possible in your life through Jesus Christ, and you begin to see the blessings that God brings, the transformation that he brings in your life. You aren't the same person that you were yesterday if you were born again. You're different today because God is working in you and his mercies are renewed day by day. He's doing something new in you even today. And he's going to do something new in you tomorrow too. And as you yield to him, watch what God does. So I encourage you, learn to thank the Lord. It'll change your whole perspective.